Hi there. I'm Cindy Linden, and this is a Cook Along Podcast Quick Bite. I just got back from my first trip to Hawaii. I went to the big island and really had a lovely time, saw all kinds of fabulous tropical fish while I was snorkeling or even just standing and looking down into the gorgeous clear water off of one of the black sand beaches. Did not get to see any sea turtles, which was a very big disappointment to me. But I guess I might have to go back someday or somewhere else where I can do that. And we also saw by night the caldera of the Kilauea volcano. It was so staggering to see that red lava, which in the daytime is just gray. You can't tell. But at night, it's glowing orange red and sputtering and flowing and shooting out rocks. It's astonishing. It really is. It's something I never expected to see, despite living in Portland, Oregon, very close to a volcano that went off while I was watching it, uh, Mount St. Helens in Washington. But it was just smoke and ash. We didn't see anything like this. Anyhow, one of the other things we did was visit and tour a vanilla farm. I think it's the only one in the United States. And it was fascinating. I got to see the vines growing and the green beans on the vine and learned a lot. Some things I had never heard before about vanilla. So I thought that might be helpful to share because vanilla is so incredibly expensive right now and only going up from here. I don't know that it will ever come back down. So I thought it might be good to kind of talk to you a little bit about what I learned and what your options are in terms of getting the right vanilla for your baking. Many of us who cook or bake are really proud to say, yes, we only use real vanilla extract. It's a matter of personal pride and maybe is a little ridiculous, but we want our reputations to shine by only using the real thing and not the imitation stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about some of those, we'll call them issues, because they really are. You know, they're mental issues if you come right down to it. First, what is vanilla? Well, you know what vanilla smells like. You know what vanilla tastes like. Vanilla is the world's most popular flavor and fragrance. It comes from an orchid. Yes, just a flower. A flower called vanilla planifolia. It grows like a vine. And the bean is the fruit, and it is the only orchid with edible fruit. It comes out the way any other fruit does. Once the flower is pollinated, the fruit develops and the flower kind of fades away. The second question might be, where does vanilla come from? Well, first, there's Tahitian vanilla, which comes from Tahiti. And I'm not going to talk about that much because Tahitian vanilla is mostly about the aroma It's used for its aroma, which is sweet and strong and kind of floral, but it's not for baking with because it just doesn't have very much flavor at all. So we're going to concentrate on where other vanilla comes from that you can actually bake with. Northeast Madagascar is the center of the world's vanilla production, and they produce almost 80% of the global supply of vanilla. So aside from the beans... Vanilla comes in various forms. You've probably seen vanilla powder and vanilla paste and vanilla extract, which is the most commonly used one. And that is derived from the seed pods of the vanilla orchid vines. So in other words, you take one of those long pods that the vine grew from the flower and you slice it down the middle lengthwise. And these teeny, 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 tiny little seeds will become something you can use to flavor your dishes. You will have seen it in like vanilla bean ice cream. Those little black flecks in there, little dark brown flecks, are the seeds of the vanilla pot. And then there is synthetic vanilla, which is artificial vanilla, and that's manufactured in a lab. And just for statistics sake, only 1% of the world's vanilla is real. The rest is all imitation. The next question might be, why is it so expensive? It is incredibly expensive. You can get silver, pure silver, for less money per ounce than vanilla beans. 
It is the second most expensive spice in the world, coming right behind saffron, which actually is produced in a similar way, as part of a flower that has to get carefully picked. The reason it's so expensive, there's a couple of reasons. The first is that Madagascar, where 80% of the world's beans are grown, had a huge cyclone in 2017, wiped out 30% of the island's vanilla bean crop. And so, law of supply and demand, the prices shot through the roof. And then, because of the resulting world shortage in Madagascar vanilla beans, the other place that grows vanilla beans, which is Mexico, the demand went up for their beans, and so the price for that also went up. And then food corporation giants like Unilever and Nestle have discovered that putting the word natural or pure on their products makes them sell better. They have both of them deteriorating public images. Their reputation has plummeted. And in order to fix that, they've moved toward using more natural ingredients so they can put that on the box. That means that Nestle and Unilever and other large commercial buyers are buying up what little pure extract there is. And that, of course, means that there's less for you to buy in the grocery store, which means it's more expensive. So when you try to go baking, you're paying more because Nestle wanted it first. So you'd think if it was worth so much money, people would try to grow it. And indeed, they do. This place that I visited in Hawaii is rare. It's the only place outside of Mexico and Madagascar that they've been able to really make the vanilla beans grow. And the reason is because they need very specific conditions. They need growing temperatures of 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 inches of rain per year. Now that means it's tropical, it's humid, it's hot, and it's wet. However, if it doesn't also get a dry spell, they won't produce any flowers because the reason they produce flowers is because they think they're about to die and they better replicate themselves. Those things alone make it difficult to grow the vanilla, but it gets much harder than that. First of all, the plants have to be shocked into thinking they're going to die in order to force them to bloom. The easiest way to do that is to deprive them of water for a while until they start to get droopy. And then the plants will panic and shoot out a flower to try to rescue their species. So somebody has to be paying attention and go and shock the plants and then revive them after they start to flower. Okay. The next thing is that when they do flower, vanilla orchids bloom for only one day and they have to be pollinated within a four hour window before they close again, and they have to be pollinated by hand. All of the vanilla orchids natural pollinators are extinct. All, every single one of the vanilla plants that produce vanilla in the world today are all pollinated by hand. If the flower blooms at night when no one's around, it just doesn't get pollinated. And it's a little tricky to pollinate them because you can't hurt the flower. You have to scoop the pollen from one part of the flower and distribute it on a different part of the same flower in order to pollinate it. And all of that has to be done with very tiny instruments by hand. So every single vanilla bean that you ever see has been created by the work of a single person's hand in pollinating. And here's the other thing. You can't pollinate too many flowers. Let's say you've shocked that plant into creating a bunch of flowers. You can't pollinate all of them because you'll wear the plant out. It takes too much energy for the plant to produce too many beans at one time. So you have to be judicious about how many you pollinate, even though you want more vanilla beans so that you could sell them and make some money to pay for your vanilla bean operation. You have to be careful not to over pollinate them or they will just give up and die. The next thing about growing vanilla beans that deters people, I'm sure, is that once they've sprouted the bean, okay, the flower's gone, you've got a bean, the beans need six months on the vine. Not many vanilla producers leave them that long, they just can't. They take them off and they start to process them a little earlier, but it's best if they stay on the vine just to get long enough 
because they won't be a grade A bean unless they're at least eight inches long. And the tip just starts to get a little yellow brown before you pick it. These people in Hawaii are doing that because it's a very small operation. They're not trying to create the world's vanilla supply. So they take a little extra time to leave them on the vine. And then after that six months on the vine, they need six weeks to dry in the sun during the day. And every single night, those beans have to be moved indoors and put into burlap bags or cloth lined boxes and closed into the dark and then taken back outside the next day, every day for six weeks. After that, they need two to three months to dry and then three more months after that in closed boxes to cure and develop their flavor. So your total time for a batch of beans to be ready for the market is 13 months per batch of beans. Now if you figure in the time and the very careful hands-on labor for all of those steps, the return on raising and selling vanilla beans dwindles to the labor of love, really. The lifespan of a vine is about 20 years if it's putting out a whole lot of beans. In other words, if you really wear the plant out, it will still probably live for about 20 years and keep putting out beans. But here's the cool thing about it. If you're careful and you control how many beans you encourage it to create, it can live forever. And here's something else that's kind of cool. All the vanilla plants are grown from cuttings, not from those seeds inside the beans. So essentially, you're always regrowing the same plant. So in other words, you cut off part of the vine and you put it in water or some kind of rooting compound. I didn't find that out. And you wait for it to grow new roots and then you plant it. And then you watch it to see if it's going to thrive. And that is the same plant you just took it off of. It's just a new piece of it. So anyway, if you don't overwork them, they'll live forever. But that means you can't produce a whole ton of beans from them or you're sacrificing your plants. Now let's get to the nitty gritty. What's the best vanilla for us to buy? Well, I buy Penzies because I really like it. Their single strength vanilla is a little stronger, about 25% stronger than McCormick's or whoever you might get in the grocery store. And the price... It may seem high when you're looking at it, and you can see those prices at penzies.com or in a local store if you're lucky enough to have one, is not that much higher than things you're paying for in the grocery store. It, it may sometimes even be less. Vanilla is just really expensive everywhere right now, so the prices at Penzies may not be as bad as you think. If you are buying vanilla beans, you'll see them in stores or in Mexican grocers or expensive shishi grocery stores, and maybe even sometimes in less expensive stores. The top grade beans, they should be straight and thick and at least eight inches long. These are the best top grade beans, okay? With dark, oily, shiny brown surface and pliable. In other words, they shouldn't be stiff or brittle. They should kind of bend. They'll sometimes have white powder on the surface. Those are crystals of vanillin. This is the chemical that makes the vanilla flavor, so this is a good thing. The beans from Madagascar are the ones that determine the industry standard for grade A beans. So everything is compared to the Madagascar beans. Now you should know that any pure vanilla extract may have as little as 0 0.05 grams of vanillin in it, and an 8-ounce bottle from Penzi's or even Costco can run you well upwards of $50. The price of imitation vanilla stays flat. It tends not to go up or down. Baker's imitation vanilla, for instance, has 0.58 grams. So in other words, 10 times the amount of vanillin. And an 8-ounce bottle is about a dollar, sometimes two. So what's the difference? Well, there was an article in Cook's Illustrated a couple of years ago by a writer named Hannah Crowley, and she discusses the difference between real and imitation vanilla and what happened in a blind taste test. And these people who participated in the test were professional chefs. They were not just, you know, Joe Schmo off the street. They were people who know their baking stuff. For the most part, their tasters couldn't tell the difference between the real vanilla 
and the artificial vanilla. Now, why is that? You'd think you'd be able to tell the difference because since so many people are touting that they use real vanilla in things, you think it must be significantly better. Both are flavored with vanillin. The lab created the synthetic or artificial vanilla has the same exact molecular makeup as the vanilla that comes from the beans produced by the vanilla orchard. So it's going to taste the same. But pure vanilla extract contains between 0.03 to 0.1 grams of the vanillin in 100 milliliters. Imitation vanilla contains between 0.32 and 0.64 grams of vanillin. In other words, up to 21 times as much vanillin. So which do you suppose tastes more vanilla-y? Here's the other thing. Pure vanilla extract has a minimum of 35% alcohol. The rest is water. Water. The FDA says because you can't sell pure alcohol as food without some sort of regulation that you can use as much as 35% alcohol in your commercial vanilla extract. But the rest has to be water. So you're automatically diluting the flavor of your vanilla if you're using the real thing. Imitation vanilla has little or no alcohol. And that means not only is it stronger flavored because it's not diluted, it also means that you're not picking up any alcohol flavoring. I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute because I'm going to tell you how to make your own vanilla. When the flavor is extracted from real vanilla beans, vanilla is only one of the flavors in the resulting extract. Because it's grown on a plant in soil and air, it absorbs flavors from around it. Vanilla can be only one of maybe 250 flavors in an extract. Now this could be a good thing, but they can also be unpredictable in flavor and intensity. So sometimes they just are flavors that taste like they don't belong with the vanilla. Sometimes I'm sure they add flavors to the vanilla that are nice. And that's perhaps one of the reasons to go ahead and use real vanilla. But many taste testers really preferred the pure vanilla flavor of the imitation vanilla to the complexity of the floral or mineral notes or whatever that gets added into the growing plants. The vanilla essence is easily synthesized in the laboratory for a fraction of the price of natural vanilla. The Cook's Illustrated taste testers preferred the imitation stuff. Specifically, they liked Baker's imitation vanilla Baker's uses two different kinds of synthetic vanillin, and that's what the testers liked the best because it had a stronger flavor. And again, remember, these are hoity-toity cooking folks doing a blind taste test. So you have to assume they know why they like what they're tasting and that maybe they'll go use it. So, okay, what's the downside of the imitation vanilla? Well, two things. First... The industrially manufactured vanillin uses a chemical derived from petroleum. I know. That's, I know. It makes me really sad, too, because we're supposed to be trying to use less of those things. Also, almost all the brands contain artificial color, and that's less of a big deal than the petroleum, but still. Some companies add other flavorings, maybe trying to mimic the things that come into real vanilla. Who can say? Secondly, there's really, I suppose, the potential damage to our pride. Nobody wants to say, hey, these fabulous cookies you like, or this lovely ice cream that you're tasting that I just got out of the ice cream maker, were made with imitation vanilla. Isn't that cool? Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to be caught using something other than real vanilla. There's this pride factor that keeps us from being willing to take something that it, we perceive as second best even when it's really not second best, the perception is really hard to get past. Now we're going to talk about how to fix it. Is there a way to make your own vanilla extract rather than spend so much on the commercial brands of dubious quality? The answer is yes. If you want to make your own, there are some significant advantages to doing that. Because you don't have to dilute the alcohol with water, the extraction process goes deeper and you get a stronger flavor from the beans. 
You can just use all alcohol, no water, and the flavor of the vanilla will come out stronger than it does in the ones that have been diluted at the store. You can use any alcohol for that, but if you use a flavored alcohol like a bourbon or a rum, you'll get a vanilla flavored bourbon or a vanilla flavored rum because the flavors in those alcohols don't go away. So the best bet is to use an alcohol that's fairly flavorless. I've heard people use Everclear, but I have also heard that's so high in alcohol, you can kind of burn your beans with it. The best bet is probably vodka. You put one bean, you're going to use a sharp knife and slit it open all the way down the length of the bean. You're going to cut it in half or in pieces, depending on the size of your bottle. One bean into four ounces of alcohol. And then cap it and put it in a cool, dark place for at least six months. Here's another reason this is a really good idea. When your homemade vanilla extract is gone, fill the bottle back up with another four ounces of vodka and put it away again for six months and you'll get a second batch. And when that vanilla extract is gone, fill that bottle and stick it away for six months. You can get three batches of homemade vanilla from one bean. Now, what may not happen is it may not turn very brown, but the flavor is going to be good. And that might also mean that your baked goods turn out to be lighter in color than, you know, that usual kind of slightly caramel color that happens when you put brown vanilla in. So don't be dismayed if it stays clear. That's okay. You're still going to have a really good vanilla flavor, much stronger vanilla flavor than you can get from anything you can buy. So strong, in fact, that you may need to back off a little bit on your recipes, although more vanilla sometimes is just the ticket. So yes, I absolutely recommend that you make your own. If you really don't want to do that, then I will say that I use Penzies and that they have a single strength vanilla, as I mentioned, that's about 25% stronger than your grocery store. They also have a double strength that I love using. It just makes a really pronounced vanilla flavor in baked goods. But again, it still has 65% water in there. Penzi's has both Mexico and Madagascar vanilla beans if you wanted to make your own vanilla. If your pride isn't too damaged by doing so, search out some of that baker's vanilla. I have that in the house in addition to the Penzi stuff. And I bought a vanilla bean at the Hawaiian Vanilla Company, and we're going to make our own. And I would suggest you consider their website as well, the Hawaiian Vanilla Company. You can buy beans from them. They are grade A beans. They're longer than any other beans I've seen, which means there's more vanilla in them, you know, more of those inside beans. And they're really soft and bendable and pliable, and they smell amazing. So you could consider giving them your business as well. It all has to be done online. If you get a bean and you forget you have it and you let it sit too long, in the first place, it's going to stay pliant for a really, really long time. But if you get past that and it gets stiff or brittle, here's a trick. Wrap a piece of white bread around the bean and put it in a Ziploc for a day or two, a Ziploc bag. Take it back out and it'll be pliant again. The choice is up to you. You can be as adventurous as you like and maybe imitation vanilla is an adventure for you. And maybe making your own vanilla is an adventure for you. And I say vanilla is so good. Why not try both of those things and compare them to your store-bought or Penzi's vanilla and see what you find out? Try making some vanilla pudding or something where you can actually taste what each one tastes like and see what you like best. You can see photos from the vanilla farm at my website, thecookalongpodcast.com. Just type the word vanilla into the search bar or go up to the heading Quick Bites and look for what's the best vanilla. I hope you will visit there. And then, of course, there are a lot of recipes on that website for ways to use that vanilla. Tell your friends you listen to the Cook Along podcast. I will see you back here in two weeks for another Quick Bite podcast. And remember that the weeks in between the Quick Bites are the actual recipes, brand new recipes posted every other week that you can listen to and cook with if you feel so inclined. And until next time, 
happy cooking. 